years ago. No. It's not work. And it's not All right. Okay. We'll refresh it. So you got one based on oil. It's not going to be Lawman. I'm the VP of Operations here at UAV Direct Maxer, and uh, thanks again for coming to this training session on aerial <coughs> mapping. It's going to be taught this morning uh, by Jeff and Mark. Uh, they are from Vertical Aspects, and they're going to be telling you a bit about their background. Uh, but one thing I do want to say about these guys is they have many, many decades of uh, aerial experience, flying the aircraft, manned and unmanned, and the mapping. So these are two guys that if you're interested in mapping, you need to tap into and uh, get inside their head this morning. And uh, uh, Jeff, go ahead. Great, well thanks uh, Jake for that introduction. Uh, my uh, partner Mark uh, Paulson here, glad to see we've got a full house here. We'll try to keep it uh, moving along. We've got a couple sections where you can ask questions, but if there's uh, something that you need to ask while we're doing it, Please feel free to. If it's something that we're going to cover later on in the presentation, we will let you know that. 
And uh, so why don't we kind of talk about uh, what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a little bit about our backgrounds and how some of the things we've done in the past have led us to where we are here. Uh, before we do that, could I get a show of hands as far as uh, how many people in here actually own Phantoms? Okay. Uh, most of you probably have the Phantom Vision or the Vision uh, Plus. Okay. How about uh, the Inspire One? Okay. Uh, now, are you? Uh, are there any surveyors in the crowd? Okay, great. Well, Mark is a registered uh, professional land surveyor, so any of the hard questions, I'm going to pass off to Mark here. I'll just take the easy ones. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're going to talk about the mapping theory, uh, and then we're going to go through how to actually capture these images uh, using a sample fixed wing as well as the phantom. Then we'll take a, a break while Mark and I set up. We're going to fly some short representative missions out uh, back. We've actually already flown both of these missions uh, a couple weeks ago when we processed them. So the slides that you see here, a lot of it is going to be uh, what uh, was actually out back. You'll see uh, more of this building than you're ever going to want to see at the parking lot out back in the uh, field. Uh, that's what those maps are taken from over there. Those maps are actually, the one on the left was done with the SenseFly EB, the uh, fixed wing that Mark's going to be flying, and the one on the right was done with the uh, Phantom. So uh, these were done by us, it's as straight as they came out of the uh, machine and then printed by Mark. So uh, when we show you what you're getting with the product, this is what you actually get. We do have some. Uh, marketing slides in here but just to get uh, better data sets but most of the stuff is stuff that we've actually done here so um, and then uh, we'll show the uh, uh, post-flight processing and then do a little bit of a wrap-up after that okay so my uh, background a lot of things have led me to this. I got out of college, uh, worked for a radio uh, for a television station for a while so kind of got my love of uh, uh, videography, being a uh, camera operator, uh, decided I wanted to do more with my life, ended up joining the Navy, uh, ended up making it a career, was a pilot for 24 years, uh, most of that in rotary wing. Towards the end of that, when they take you out of the cockpit, my love kind of uh, turned to I uh, information technology, so I ended up getting a master's in IT, went through the DOD uh, Chief Information Officer School, and my last tour was the Chief Information Officer for the Navy Pentagon staff. And uh, if you look at the dates there, yeah, that was right about the time of 9-11. I'd actually put in my retirement papers for the end of September uh, of, of 1, and ended up delaying for about another six months to try to help put the Pentagon IT infrastructure back together again. So, um, a lot of personal memories of 9-11 uh, for me there. Uh, after that, went to work for Lockheed Martin. Uh, ended up doing a couple programs in the DC area. What was in the Immigration Naturalization Service, Patent and Trademark Office. Got down to New Orleans just in time for Hurricane Katrina. I can tell you about that. No, there's not a black cloud over my head. <laughs> next to me here. And then um, I also got involved, probably like a lot of you did. Um, trying to fly the RC helicopters, realized those are a lot of fun and very challenging to fly, and was thrilled when DJI came out with the multi-rotor. actually had someone build my first F-450 for me, and then I figured, well, the only way I'm really going to learn this after I crashed it was rebuilding it, put more stuff on it, turned it into an F-550, and I bought an S-800, and then Mark bought the uh, Phantom, and he was doing the uh, fixed wing uh, sales around the same time, and we just purchased a couple of uh, Inspires as well too. So we've got a wide range of experience with the DJI products, and uh, Mark certainly with the uh, fixed wing products as well too. Okay, Mark? Hello everybody, Hello. 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 guys and gals. Uh, Jeff's a Navy guy, I'm a Marine guy. I don't have any appropriate uh, mixed company Navy and Marine jokes. <laughs> uh, I started out wanting to be an architect, not a surveyor, and uh, unfortunately I couldn't get hired uh, 
in Bryan College Station where I grew up, Texas A&M, I know y'all are probably yeah. Longhorn. And uh, so I went to work for the engineering department and stuff, stayed there as a draftsman. Eventually became uh, registered and been practicing surveying pretty much uh, the rest of my life. Uh, built my first computer in 78, so I'm kind of a, a uh, little bit geeky on that side. And I also am a private pilot. Uh, so when we were trying to come up with a company name, uh, Jeff's wife actually said, why don't you just call it Two Old Geeks? That's who I wrote what's available though. <laughs> Did you register? Uh, so we were introduced by a common friend who knew that uh, I was doing the drones and he was doing the drones. I just happened to buy a Phantom 2 Plus. Uh, off the web before I knew about these guys. I don't. I think you told me about them. Uh, anyway, we're, we want to thank UAB Direct for having us. And if you, probably most of you deal with them now. They're great guys to deal with, and they've really taken care of us uh, in our endeavors. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, mapping, the theory, and the uh, products. Basically, in my mind, there's two types of maps. There's a graphical map, and then there's a real map. The real map gives you some information you can use. The graphical map is like uh, how to get to the zoo, uh, go see the Alamo, we just grabbed that off the web somewhere. Uh, there's generally not to scale, you can't rely on them anything other than trying to figure out how to get somewhere. This is uh, the UADB direct uh, property right here. The yellow line, as you can see, was the actual boundary that uh, Steve uh, provided me from a surveyor. So I put that in uh, ArcGIS and threw it on top of that <coughs> video. And uh, that's how we uh, came up with part of that map by merging a couple of them together. You surveyors have been around, I've been around probably longer than most of you, but this slide's kind of uh, inaccurate the way it kind of gives you the idea that you start there and we've gone up to satellites. But truly, the uh, original flights that have been doing them for as long as I can remember is the airplane. They've been uh, doing photogrammetry for years and they would take two photos and put it under what they call a stereo plotter and draw contours with it back in the old days. Well then we swapped over, well technically I guess you say the on the ground survey came before the aerial because we've been doing that for a thousand years. But then the uh, satellites came along and that made our life a lot easier. Now we have the EB and uh, our fixed wing, and then we have the uh, Phantom, and the that puts it into our hands. And, you know, stuff that was just you know an airplane, couple hundred thousand, couple hundred thousand for a camera, we couldn't afford to do it. And the really nice thing is the 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 quadcopter and the drone, the fixed wing, is the accuracy you get. We're getting better accuracy than you're ever going to get with the fixed wings unless they're going to get down around 400 feet and that's not going to happen anytime soon. The little survey guy in there holding up the uh, GPS and you surveyors that GPS is not in the trash that's a prop so <laughs> don't try to take it out of here. Uh, that's what we use for uh, getting our ground control points. This is going to be boring but I'm sorry we kind of have to get into it a little bit. The market, if you're trying to market to somebody, especially a surveyor or engineer, you're going to have to know something about coordinate systems. And uh, does anybody know what the satellites use? The coordinate system. Pardon? NMEA. It's actually just a Cartesian coordinate based on the center of the, the deal. But they all have, every receiver has the uh, software built in it to get WGSA4. So, but there's two types of uh, coordinate systems that are mainly in use in our area. It's the Mercator and the Lambert Conformal. And uh, the Mercator is like if you took a football field, I mean a basketball, and you put a cone uh, cylinder around it. It's based on the equator. The farther north you get, the more inaccurate you get. The Lambert conformal uh, projection is what we use in Texas. We have five zones. If you can see this little area here, this is what's known as a state plane coordinate. It's not the surface. 
is generally lower than what has a scale factor of less than one. So 100 feet might be 99.999 feet. This is pretty much what all engineers and surveyors are using. Contractors will tend to take that and use the reciprocal of that scale factor to raise things up and it also expands things out because they're wanting to get paid on their quantities. So they're wanting more money. So you will get into projects if you really get into this that have what they call a project coordinate system or they call it a surface coordinate system. Generally, they're a couple thousand feet different than what you're going to get from WGS 84. I did a demo at the Domain in Austin recently, and uh, I processed it and threw it in there, and lo and behold, when I threw it on top of the background map, it was way off. So I called them up and said, hey, are you guys using Project coordinates? Oh yeah, we didn't give those to you. So I had to reprocess my data to get it into the correct coordinate system. The slide on the left shows projections. I don't know if you can read it that well. It shows what the U.S. would look like in the different coordinate systems. You have the Mercator up there in the red, the Lambert in the uh, blue, and the uh, unprojected latitude and longitude in the green. On the right is the, what we use in Texas. Uh, here we're in the central. The Liberty Hill Austin area is in the Texas central, which is 4203. Uh, and a lot of map, mapping software will ask you for these numbers for coordinate conversions. Now, to get an accurate map located on the Earth, you have to use ground control points. And ground control points are generally in the state plane coordinate system. The software people will tell you you need a minimum of three. I'm going to tell you, I'm not doing anything that I'm going to hang my hat on unless I have five of them. And I want five, if, if we were going to do this, let's say this is on a, a project, and my track was sitting in here, I want four on the outside and one or two on the inside. Uh, <clears throat> if you're going to be doing your survey for other people, other professionals, they're going to try and stick you with some liability. So you want to make sure you know what you're doing and get it orientated right. The best way to get out of that if you're not a surveyor is do it for another surveyor and have him set the ground control points because that's a whole different ball of wax and it's a lot of money. That unit there is uh, about 15,000 uh, bucks to purchase one. What's the point of the ground control point? What is it? It rectifies it to the ground in what? your uh, project. Okay. your photographs okay. the point cloud so in other words when you pick a point in that picture the surveyor can go out and set that point on the ground okay. does that make sense okay. uh, there's all different kinds of way of attaining ground control points as far as I'm concerned the three on the bottom left are useless uh, Jeff will not agree with me on that uh, but you have to have ground control points to get it into the right place on the face of the earth. Well, what if you took like a terminal GPS unit, you know, one of the higher GPS and went out? And well, it, it doesn't matter if the brands, Trimble makes them, Topcon makes them. But something so, similar to that and went out? Yeah, we're talking sub centimeter though. Yeah. You're not going to do it with a handheld. Okay. You can get it close. Mm -hmm. If close is all you need, it's okay. But if you're going for a market to sell to another surveyor or provide a service to a surveyor, engineer, or architect, you're going to need good, high quality ground control. This is what uh, the flight that we did uh, a couple weeks ago with the uh, Phantom. Very good quality. But as you can see, our initial processing, if you look up here, you can see where the driveway's not hooked, lined up. Jeff used some. Uh, I call them alignment points, he calls them ground control, with Google Earth, and these were points he picked out of our photographs that he also knew he could get in Google Earth. And he put those uh, pins in there, he actually put it into the software and he put that to market. So as you can see, where the driveway was off before, right in here, see how nice it lines up? And this may be all you want, need. I'm not telling you that you have to go out and get a great 
uh, surveying equipment to get into the business. Real estate people, uh, there's all kinds of market for this kind of stuff. If you want to get into the technical side of it, though, you're going to have to get some, either somebody to do it for you or get some uh, good equipment on it. Yeah, so as I understand it, what the ground control points that I put in there, they were Google ground control points, so it lines it up well with Google, but it's not really lined up well with the real world, and the surveyors would all give it a thumbs down, because. but if you're looking for something that you can show to a layperson or a real estate, and you need it to line up with Google Earth, and, and like Mark said, it doesn't have to have that accuracy, this may be good enough for you. Do you lay out panel markers, or, or do you just? I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, yes, I do. Well, I don't lay out panel markers. I typically, when I'm doing a demo, I carry a pan, uh, can of white paint. And I paint an X on the ground and I shoot it with a with a GPS. You can get fancy. The best ones I found that I found the easiest in the photographs was <coughs> where they uh, took a paper plate and put a nail in the center of it. <laughs> so you don't have to get. We'll go out and build the, the big fancy uh, X's like we did for uh, aerial photography back in the day. Yes, sir. Assuming one could afford something like this, what's the learning curve to learn how to operate one of those? To learn how to operate, it's not that big. Do it properly. To know what, if you're getting the right answer, it's a pretty steep learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, can, that. anybody can push the button. What do you get out of the uh, the uh, drones and the map data using the software? Well, you get an ortho mosaic. Uh, does anybody know what ortho rectified means? I had to look it up when I got into this. Ortho rectified is an image that is corrected for elevation, camera, and tilt. So an ortho mosaic is they take all the images and correct them, running it through software, and then they put them all together to make the overall map. You also get the 3D point cloud, which is very important because it uses the 3D point cloud because it has the elevation data to get to the ortho mosaic. Also, the 3D point cloud is what you can get quantities from, you can build a model from, you can build a surface, uh, and I'm probably boring most of you non-technical people to death, so I'm going to skip that. Then we also get the uh, the digital, oh, and topographic. Everybody knows what a contour map is, right? Okay, you can generate contours with this, uh, very accurate contours. And then we have a digital surface model. Does anybody know what the difference between a digital surface model and a digital terrain model? Surface model shows trees and it shows everything. If if the if you stand still and the image quality which the phantom is because we saw I saw people in some of the point clouds when we were standing around when we did it, you'll get the tops of their heads and shoulders. And this is included on the software or this is all extra software that you have to purchase. You have to purchase some form of software to create the, the ortho mosaics, the point clouds, and everything else. You don't get it with the Phantom. You can't get it for free. Uh, they give you free versions, kind of like uh, those apps that you buy that so free. And you, oh, you want it to do something? You got to pay some pay more money. What about uh, RCAP, GIS, does the Phantom, or does, you know, the GIS software that that's out Yeah, there? well, that was done with ArcGIS right over there. That's what I thought, but I'm yeah. not sure that you could Yes, uh, you, that, that's varied outputs, which we'll get into here shortly. Uh, potential customers, uh, you're wanting to get into this? Surveyors, engineers, real estate people, planners, environmentalists, uh, anybody that's interested in quantities. Uh, I did a demo in Houston for uh, Southern Crust Concrete. They have 20 yards. They want to keep track of how, how much aggregate they have in their piles. Uh, see if they're losing any, if they're uh, making money. So there's all kinds of customers. It's how detailed that you want to get into it. My personal uh, opinion is the more technical you are, the more money you get to charge. The real estate crowd is probably on the far uh, 
lower end of the spectrum, <coughs> engineers are probably on the high end of the spectrum. <coughs> Here's the, some of the output types that you can get out of the software. Uh, dense five point clouds, I'm not going to go through every one of them. The, the ones that most people are going to be interested in are contour lines. Uh, the classified point cloud and your uh, elevation models. And we just went over that digital surface. Most of the uh, <coughs> engineer surveyors, that type who want to build models, see how much, where the branch is going, how, uh, the flood study guys, I forget what their technical name is, want the DTM. They don't care about the trees, the cars, or anything else. This particular software, and I'm not up on all of them, there's other brands of them out there, will build what we call an oblique model. Uh, just playing around, I walked around Jeff's uh, Jeep with my iPhone, clicking pictures. I don't, took about 20 of them all the way around it. I built a 3D model of his Jeep. So, don't know what good it's for, but, well actually I do know. Uh, a long time ago, I used to do uh, surveys of vehicles for a guy that did crash reconstruction. One of the things they did is volume comparisons from a crash compared to a new car. It told them something. So now you could build models of cars for the accident reconstruction guys. This is the unclassified point cloud. That is not a photograph. That is actually, if we we're not running live, zoomed in, you would see little dots all throughout that thing. The closer you zoom in, the farther they'll spread out. Those are actual three-dimensional pixels. They also have a red, green, blue value, so that's why it looks like a picture. So you can actually do measurements in this type of a point cloud, which we'll get into here shortly. This is a classified point cloud. Can you see the difference? See the black spots? This is the objects that were removed from the classified point cloud. So your surveyors, engineers, whatever, are going to want this point cloud here to start working to generate their surface. This is uh, the digital surface model, just colored by elevation. So as you can see, the buildings are higher, uh, lower is the blue. Here's the contour lines, and as you can see the little squares in there, those are buildings. And these are the contour lines, it's just nothing but terrain. We removed all the buildings in. Okay, we talked a little bit about orthomosaic versus uh, uh, planar. Planar, uh, you guys seen the, uh, some of the cameras do it now. You just take a picture and then it stitches them all together. Mm -hmm. in a okay. You can, there's software out there that will do it the same way from the top down. You're not going to get any accuracy. You're going to get a pretty picture, uh, which is neat, but it's only, you know, small data sets, which y'all can all read, and it has very few key points that it uses for matching. The ortho mosaic is taking thousands of points. In fact, I think to get the most optimal, it has to have over 8,000 points of matches per image. Uh, it preserves the integrity. You can start measuring distances in there, and you can get three-dimensional dis distances out of the ortho mosaic. Now, when you're flying along, you're taking these pictures. How do you know where to take the pictures? How far apart do you take them? We'll get into that okay. in a minute. All right. <laughs> As here we were talking about uh, accurate measurements. As you can see, this this is a telephone pole out back. <coughs> These are the transformers up here. Those are the crossbars. So we picked a point near the base of the pole and we picked a point during the top. And I think initially we picked it, Jeff missed and got a tree back in here so it was way off. So what you had to do in this particular software is you move the yellow until they're right where you want it, right on top or right on the bottom. I'm sorry if I'm in the way of somebody. Now this is in meters right here. But if you multiply that out, it's going to be about 37, 38 feet. That is the height of that pole that's right back there.
And that's all inferred from top-down pictures? Yes. Uh, I might talk to that for a minute. It's kind of out of Everybody know what the nadir is? You know what the... Uh, it's straight down, uh, and we got straight up. Zenith. Zenith. Yeah, thanks, man. I should know that. I measure zenith angles all the time. Zenith is from your eye up, nadir's down, and it's straight down, as close as possible. So all the photogrammetry is got done nadir if possible. And the nice thing about the phantoms and the inspire when it gets there is it has that gimbal so it takes out a lot of the the airplane when we fly it later you're going to see it you get a much higher quality image with the quadcopter than you do with the airplane well there were some questions well, there even even a plane fixed wing thing with a gimbal on it you could do that okay, okay, okay. yeah uh, I know they're out there, but I've seen very few that are in commercial use. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the big airplane, the piloted airplanes, mm -hmm. they are gimbal mounted, yes. Any hyperspectrometer imaging capabilities yet? Yes. Well, that's more dependent on the ha hardware than it is on the uh, uh, <coughs> software. This particular software actually does have. Uh, where you can use uh, different spectrums like near infrared, red edge. Uh, they have a multi-spectral camera for the fixed wing that I deal with most of the time. Uh, they also have thermal, and all this is getting really exciting. It's changing so fast it's really hard to keep up, and you guys are kind of like on the cutting edge of it. Uh, the workflow, they're two different tools. If you want to fly an intersection or I'd say up to about two acres, three acres, the Phantom will do a wonderful job. The, the image of the building there, we actually only flew about half of that. Uh, the actual flight plan, which Jeff will show later, only went to like right through here. We didn't want to get out on the highway and we'll go into why later. Uh, but that was 57, 58 images to, to create that map right there. This took uh, about, I don't know, 18, 19 minutes, and I think there's like 260 images in that one. Is there 30-something acres here? 30, it's, I say it in there, it's 30 plus. <laughs> okay, so they're two different tools. Uh, as a surveyor, I use GPS sometimes, Sometimes I get out with the old gun. Well, they're not too old anymore. They're all electronic. But depending on what the job I'm going to do is what tool I'm going to do. So you could get into this relatively inexpensive, say if you knew a contractor and he wanted you to monitor his site on a weekly basis. You could do that with the Phantom. You don't have to have a $25,000 fixed wing with all the software to do it. Fixed wing versus multi-rotor. We just kind of went into that. Uh, if you're going to go over about three or four acres right now today, probably over two, you better get a fixed wing to do it. If you have a small area, uh, intersection, a yard, something like that, the Phantom's a great tool. I'm really impressed with it. Uh, we've been experimenting with the Inspire, and once they get some software for it, I think it's really going to be great. The nice thing about the multi-rotor, you can get it in and out of a real small place. i got to have room to launch that airplane and retrieve it. Uh, you fly it at higher altitude, we don't get as much detail because of longer flight time, but it's considerably more expensive than a Phantom setup. And it is hand launch, but you still have to land. Yes. yes. Okay. What's the uh, what's limitations for doing the Inspire right now? Why can't the software handle it? It's just the images, right? I'm going to let Jeff talk to that in a little bit. Uh, it's, it's mainly software. Any, any experience between the, cross, the crossovers between the, that you can do a VTOL with a fixed wing? You mean merge the two? The, yeah, there's, there's a few platforms that are out there. 
Uh, oh, you're talking about the ones like the Tilbrook? Pull the rudders off and stick the wings on and fly it? I mean, they're cheap now, but just the concept. Uh, I think it's a great concept. I haven't seen one that I would want right. to uh, do real work with yet. And uh, I don't know if y'all were here for Gene Robinson's uh, class. The fixed wing is pretty reliable, but you're not getting the detail. So if you're going to get into this, I, you know, I think he said uh, two is one. <laughs> you better think about having a backup. Uh, when I go to the field, I pretty much have a backup for everything. You know, there's nothing like going 200 miles and get ready to do the job, and you can't do the job and they want the data the next day. So you got to have to have some redundancy in your systems. And like, like the map over there shows, and we talked about already, you got the fixed wing and the multi uh, I, I think the image, of course, I couldn't zoom in very high to capture the whole area on this, but it, it's very good quality, a lot better quality than the one on the left than you're going to get with Google. Now, how, how high did you go up? That was flown approximately 350 feet. Oh. The, the multi-rotor, the Phantom, flies at 50 meters right now. We have one that we did a, a test flight on with the Inspire flown at about 50 feet. And believe it or not, there's cracks in this asphalt basketball court. I was able to measure the depths of those cracks. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> What's the uh, biggest range you've been able to get out of a Phantom in one battery? Uh, I'll uh, talk to that when I go through the uh, Phantom. It's more a limitation of the software right now. Uh, fixed wing, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the one I've been selling, which is the EB, and then of course the one we've been using, Jeff and I together, is the, the Phantom. Uh, everybody gets, oh, well, I'm going to get a 36 megapixel camera for my whatever y'all want to fly. Well, that's fine and dandy, but you got a 36 megapixel camera, you got huge files. And you better have a monster computer when, when you process 400 images. The image, the pixel resolution is not near as important as the overlap. Uh, I've been told by the, the one of the programmers who wrote the software when I was in Switzerland that he can get extremely good maps from a five megapixel camera. The uh, Image on the left was 12 megapixel camera. The Phantom uh, Plus is what was it? 16? 14? 14? Uh, to do these, you have to have, in my opinion, autonomous software. Uh, I've tried, Jeff will be flying, and I'm sitting there going, click, click, click. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the uh, uh, Inspire, and how many missions did we do before we got something? To, no, it was you and your wife that actually did it. Uh, yeah, there was uh, gaps in it. It was it was challenging at best, but you know, even as good as the Inspire is, held the altitude real well. Did you know it did a good job of going back and forth, but it was still challenging to get the correct amount of overlap on it. Uh, some of this is just uh, common sense. Uh, suggestions. Uh, are you going to go into our problems? Or yes. So, uh, okay. did, did you speak to the <coughs> issue of image uh, or sensor size versus the accuracy on the ground? Like, say the third inch uh, sensors in the, the Inspire and all that versus a larger camera? I can't. I'm not an expert on that. I can tell you that. In my testing with the EB, which is a basically it's a point and shoot. What is it? APC? Is that what that side APSC. is? APSC. Yeah. The most I was off from hand surveying and conventional surveying versus the flight was a tenth of a foot. And I don't know which is more accurate, whether it was the EB or me, because it was in between two shots that I had taken in some very rocky ground of our place in Johnson City. Uh, my personal opinion, <laughs> not scientific, 
is I have two uh, cameras for the fixed wing, a 16 megapixel and a 12 megapixel. I fly most of it with the 12 megapixels for two reasons. It's got a bigger sensor and it will shoot raw. And I don't know who the photographers are in here. I very rarely use them. I've used them one time, but it's a backup. If the exposure's off or something's wrong, I can take those raw images and generally recover what I need. So that's my personal preference. And I, to me, it stands to sense that the bigger sensor is going to be better, whether it's the megapixels or not. Because you use a TV, it's the same, it's 1980 by 1020, whatever. 1920 by 1080. Yeah, whatever it is. That, that's going to look a lot better on an 80 inch than it is on the 32 inch. But I'm not a scientist on that. That's my opinion. So you normally shoot in RAW when you're doing these? No, I use the JPEGs. I use the RAW as a backup. Okay. So you shoot both? Yes. On, on the fixed wing. Okay. The RAW, when I tried taking pictures with the Inspire, is a little too slow. Yeah. Are you using an algorithm based quantitative? Uh, imaging. What? <laughs> <laughs> when you're thinking, when you're doing quantitative imaging, and you're trying to figure out product, is it automatic? When I'm trying to quantitative in, be, be a little more specific. When you're, when, say, yeah. say if you're flying over, you were given an example over um, a, a concrete plant, and they wanted to base their, wanted to figure out how much material they have. Yes, sir. Is are you taking from that photograph just basic measurements or is it telling you exactly can you get into is it is the software there yet the software is there okay. and we've got a slide on uh in fact we already showed that we slide just on showed on one of them yeah. 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 right there that's done entirely within the software but while while we're there uh, explain that we have a point cloud the point cloud is just as accurate whether it's orth I mean uh, ground control points or not. It doesn't change the accuracy of the point cloud. It just shifts the point cloud onto the earth. So now if you wanted only wanted a one shot deal, you can fly it without any ground control points. But if you want to go back on a weekly basis and compare that one to the next week, then you need ground control. So that's that's done with fix 4D? Yes. <coughs> no, it's not. This does a lot of work. Uh, this is the flight that I did for, uh, a, I don't know, a month or so ago. Uh, kind of a uh, screen capture of when the fixed wing was flying, how I monitor it. Uh, this is, we're going to do a little quick down and dirty demo here in a bit. Uh, same software. And it's going to be Jeff. Any, any more questions for me before Jeff takes over? Thank you. <laughs> I've got, I got one question. Um, can you use either the Vision or the Vision Plus for the uh, for the software or not? Either one. Vision or Vision Plus? Either one. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> Let me. Any any geo tag image will work. Well, let me rephrase that. Most geotag images, as long as they have the camera in the database, will work with PIX4D. And definitely the DJI cameras are in there. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Now, the app will only work with certain phantoms, and I'm going to let Jeff talk to that. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> How many of you here have actually played with this app on your phantom and actually got it? Okay, so a couple of you here. So. Hopefully I'll give you a few more tips and tricks, and if you guys have anything from your experiences, uh, please, you know, let's uh, share them with the crowd here, because these apps are still, really, they're in their infancy, they're both beta versions right now, they're making a lot of changes and updates to them, uh, there's a lot of promise here, uh, we feel that it's ready to use in some circumstances for real work here, but there is still more to be done with these apps here. Um, what do you need to make this happen? Well, you can use your iPhone or you can use an Android tablet. I'll talk to you a little bit about the differences between the iOS and the Android versions of these. You can either use a Vision or the Vision Plus. 
system. That's what the app works with. You need the capture app. You can get the capture app for free. I'll show you how to do that. And then you need to at least be able to look at this and do some manipulation. You need the Pix4D, uh, either the discovery program, which is the free version of it, or the pro version, which has all of the features enabled within the program. It's actually the same software you download for both. Once you license it up and once you start your trial, then it activates the other features. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the free trial as well, too. Okay, so for the Pix4D Capture app, this is actually from the Android version. You have on the left there, uh, you've got a grid mission, and on the right, you got a freeform mission <coughs> as well, too. Uh, the difference in between the two, as you can imagine, one is the grid. It's going to plot the grid for you just like your DJI ground station would and it'll actually uh, take off the aircraft, it'll point the camera down, it'll take it up to 50 meters, it'll fly it to the start point, it'll point it where it needs to go, and it'll start chugging along at whatever speed you tell it to, taking pictures, showing you on the screen as it takes the picture, gets to the end of the run, it stops, it pivots 90 degrees, it goes forward, pivots another 90, and then starts its next run, okay? So, and when it's done, it gets to the end, it comes back and lands pretty close to where you take, took off. It does not seem to be as accurate as the regular home point when you set a regular home point. So that's one of those lessons learned that we have. Is that start it in a little bit bigger, don't do it right next to your car because it may want to try to land on top of your car. There is a way to gain control of it. You hit the S1 switch, you bring it down and you can get manual con control of it again. But we have found it is not as accurate as the regular home point. Not sure why, but just have a little bit bigger area there. They're generally, it's generally within about 10, 15 feet, but that could be a pretty critical 10, 15 feet if you're in a very small area. How long has the software been out? I know it hasn't been very long because they just released the SDKs for it. I was an Apple guy through and through and never had even seen Android before when we first heard about this. And when we first became a dealer, they said, hey, all that's out there right now is the Android. Well, I went down to Costco and I bought a little Samsung Tab 4 8-inch mm -hmm. and have been playing with the Android version of it. So, really started in the November time frame. I think the iOS app has only been out since around the end of December, the first of the year. The iOS does not have all the capability that the uh, Android app has. It does not have the freeform mission in it yet. Um, it does not allow you to rotate the grid the way that the Android version does. Um, and um, neither one of them allow you to modify the height yet. 50 meters was what they found worked well for doing this. So they've locked it in at 50 meters. You can see it's grayed out. There will be an option for changing the altitude, something other than 50 meters. So around 150 feet is what this thing's uh, flying at. And that does seem to be a good altitude for being able to get the images here. A little bit about the freeform <coughs> mode is it'll actually allow you to hand fly the aircraft and it'll allow you to designate, I know it's hard to see the, the, uh, the uh, bottom two, the horizontal image spacing and the vertical image spacing. So it knows when the aircraft is moved the required three meters horizontally, it'll snap a picture. Or if it moves two meters vertically, it'll snap another picture. So it helps you with that. When do I take the, the uh, picture here? Yes. Does that, does that mean that, it, so you said it was the Vision Plus and the Vision? And, yeah. And then, so does that not mean the GoPro one with the Plus? Well, the problem with the GoPro, any of those, is you don't have direct control of the camera. So the only way this is going to work is if the transmitter can control that camera to take a picture. And you can't do that with the GoPro. Oh, wow. At least not without, I'm not saying that no one has developed interfaces, but this software only works it uses the DJI software development kit, okay, and then they give it to Pix4D, and then Pix4D write, writes the app to do this. So, but in regards to this free flight, the free flight actually, I've got one where someone took a GoPro and walked around a fountain and just had it in his hand. Uh, you could walk through this building and uh, use. So you could uh, do it that way. Oh. Yes, you can. Okay. You're not going to get everything on the free flight that you do. You can't do measurements with the free flight. You will get a 3D model, okay. but it doesn't have anything to actually reference it from. Unless it has that uh, the geo-referencing data, then it's you're not going to be able to get the accurate measurements. So I'll show you some slides. So if I so okay, so working with the surveyor that had the geo tags, and then you would overlay that, then that would work. 
Well, one thing we've done, and I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit about with the in Inspire, there's no app for the Inspire right now. I think you all know those that have the Inspire, there's not even a ground station for the Inspire. So you've got to hand fly that thing wherever you fly it. So when my wife and I went out and basically tried a lattice pattern like this, we ended up putting one of these little things on here. It's a GPS tracker. We velcroed it on the back of the aircraft. Yeah, I know you're not supposed to play that, but it's, I didn't think it was going to throw off the center of gravity much, and it didn't, didn't interfere with anything. What this thing does is basically gives a date time group and a GPS location. There's software that you can then take the date time group of the cameras, images, merge them with this, and you get pretty good accurate geotagging using this little $60 item here. Okay. Yes. I don't know if there's any other guys in here that custom build their crafts, but does this interface with a, a NASA, uh, NASA MV2? Well, uh, basically that's what's inside the Phantom is the, is the NASA flight control. I've never tried it with my F-450, don't know whether it would work or not. I don't uh, know that, there, uh, you know, with my F-450, I don't really have a direct way of being able to well, I surely wouldn't be able to control the camera with it. Could we do a free form with it? If you're going to use an F-450 or something else, you might want to use the ground station and put in a pattern using the ground station. And if you had the GoPro, you could have it take, an Im take a snap every half a second or second. You'd have a lot more images than you need, possibly. Does and it, doesn't it connect like to, to the wireless portion of the, um, of, of the phantom or the, the, the copter? The, the PIX 4D capture app? Well, the, yeah, the PIX 4D is, is uh, basically hooked in. Uh, kind of yeah, you're getting a live connection. It's PIX 4D is a, essentially sending the points for the Phantom to fly to. One of the things we recommended to PIX 4D, and they've been real good about listening to us as a dealer, but even their, their help and support is outstanding, we found. Uh, that we suggested, hey, rather than going down, turning the aircraft and coming back, just slide it over and slide it backwards. And they say, yeah, it's a great idea. We'd like to do that. It'll save battery power, but the DJI SDK doesn't allow for that. All we can do is give it a lap long, and the DJI portion of it is the one that commands it to go where it needs to go. Yes? I can speak a little bit to his question, at least with the Wukong M. We've done with the ground station, we've mapped with home built quads, a little GPS tagger like that, and merged the uh, information from the tagger into the metadata on there and, and got pretty good results. I don't know about the NASA, I would think that it would be similar. Yeah, and I'll get into a little bit more about the DJI, their, the way that they do their geotagging and all, uh, which is why you really need the app to go along with it. Okay, so when you actually start a mission on this, you actually start the app and it gives you a couple warnings. It said flip the S1 switch up, don't, you know, don't fly over crowds, you know, that sort of thing. And then um, when you, once you've connected to it, it shows you that you're connected to the aircraft and then uh, you hit the next button and then it actually comes up with a checklist here. And as this uh, app gets more developed, they're throwing more and more checklist items in there. So, It'll even tell you whether your SD card is in there and it's formatted, so you're not going to go flying with that SD card. Okay, it uh, will let you know whether your S1 uh, switch is where it needs to be. Uh, it it does an awful lot of things, and it's the same on what the Okay. Um, another one of those trips uh, tips that we've learned is format. Put a freshly formatted SD card in every time you do the mission. So it's only looking at that one mission on there. It'll really speed up the amount of time it takes to send the information back back down. So SD cards are cheap. Uh, change them out, have a freshly formatted one. I go into the DJI Vision app. I set all the camera settings. I uh, format it using that. So I've got a freshly formatted card when I start a new mission. You just use a 16? Pardon me? You just use a 16? 16, whatever. actually, I think I've got a 4 gig. I mean, you know, it doesn't take a whole heck of a lot. Uh, um, right now on the Android app, I think the most you can do is 100 by 100 meters. That's around 67 images. I think the iOS app, you can make it a little bit larger. I found out with uh, doing the 100 by 100 meter, uh, if I took off with a 98% battery, I'd probably land with maybe 45, 50. Um, I did have one that the battery got down to 30. 
right before it took the last picture, it aborted the flight and came home. Um, I did have all of the images except for the last one. So, yes. Can you run through one battery halfway through and then continue on another battery? Um, the app doesn't allow for that. You can certainly reset your point, like if you're doing a larger area, you can reset your point, uh, adjust the overlap a little bit, and then fly uh, another one, which would, would probably be a smarter way together. of doing it. Pardon me? And you can merge the two together? PIX4D is really good about allowing you to merge data sets. Okay. Um, you can actually, um, you can either merge them or you can process them and then you can merge them after you process them. And that's what a lot of folks do because they don't have the horsepower to be able to run 2,000 images through. They'll do them in batches of maybe a couple hundred, do the processing and uh, get all the heavy lifting done and let PIX4D merge them. And uh, it'll tend to, your PC will be a lot happier if you do that. Have you ever like put up two or three phantoms and got them to do separate missions at the same time? Uh, I have not. Uh, I have my hands full with just one. Uh, <laughs> I did do an area, I went to a baseball diamond. It was actually four baseball fields with a, you know, with a clubhouse in the middle. And I flew about four or five different missions and I did merge them together. So I did, I made sure I had adequate overlap on each one and it takes more overlap than you'd think. Uh, but yes, you can certainly do that. And uh, Mark's done it uh, certainly with the fixed wing as well, too. Does yeah. it support telemetry? Pardon me? Does it support telemetry? Uh, it has some limited uh, telemetry within the app. It'll show you the uh, battery life within the aircraft. Um, it will, um, at the end of the mission, you know, when I say screenshot, you know, I took this with my iPhone because I didn't want to try to do a screenshot when the aircraft, I didn't want to hit the power and the home button at the same time when the aircraft was still in the air. So that's why you see my uh, hand in there and you can see where it's, it's downloading the images. So what it does is it takes the images on the aircraft. So you're, you're getting the images and it also creates what's called a P4D file. And that P4D file, that's the PIX4D file. And what that does is that takes the DJI images, the images that you have, and it correctly geotags. The geotagging that DJI does, I think it's around once every five seconds. So if you use just the geotagging information, yes, the phantom images are geotagged, but if you if you throw it into PIX4D, you're gonna see a big glob here, you're gonna see nothing, you're gonna see another big glob here. It's because they're not properly geotagged. So the P4D file, um, what you want to do is download the images as it moves the images to the tablet and it's doing this wirelessly obviously from the aircraft and so you want to have enough bi uh, battery power before you shut the aircraft down to let it pass all those images uh, across. It correctly geotags them. If for some reason you can't do that, if you have the P4D file that will be sitting on your tablet and the raw geo data from your, from your images, you can merge those two together and uh, still have it e uh, extract the right uh, geotagging information. Yes. When you're doing your manual flight with your Inspire, uh, I guess you weren't generating a P4D file? Is no, no. P4, uh, PIX4D had no idea we were doing anything with that aircraft. So there was no P4D. So what we did, we uh, used the geotagger. We got better geotagging information. And then we essentially just started up PIX4D and then rather than the P4D file, which not only geotags them, it says, okay, where are those images? Where do I need to go to grab those? I already know that this is a Nadir program, uh, not an oblique program. It sets some of that stuff up for you, but you can certainly do it manually on your own. So what you're saying is that you need to download the images into your tablet before you shut the fan off to geotag yes. correctly? Yeah, so you want to leave enough battery power. That's why... That may be part of why they only have 100 by 100 meters. So, uh, you know, if you land with 60 per cent or so, which you probably will, it, it, it downloads the images. You know, and each of those image files are what, four, five, six megs or so. So it, it takes a little bit of time to do that. But you don't want to shut the aircraft down. If you do, all is not lost. You got to look on your iPhone or your uh, Android for the P4D file. You got to dig that out, and then you got to uh, take the camera card and put put both of those on your PC, and you can process it that way. Yeah. What was the flight time for the 57 photo? It was less than 10 minutes. Okay. 
So uh, if you got a good fresh battery, I always start these off with a good fresh battery. Nothing more frustrating than to get you know to the end of the flight or halfway through and have the thing return to home at 30 per cent, you know. And then you're not going to have enough power possibly to be able to pass all the imaging across. So you so you don't want to try to make these too too yeah. big. Anymore. Does um, the software support a Mac, or does it have to be PC? <coughs> Pardon me? The software itself, does it have to be PC, or does it support yes. a Mac? Yes. No Mac. No Mac. No. Okay. I'm a Mac guy. <laughs> um, now, for today's demo flight, I'm going to fly something a lot <coughs> like this. Not exactly this, because I'm going to use the iPhone instead of the Android. And the iPhone right now does not allow you to rotate it, so it's not going to be parallel to the back of the building. It's going to be a little skewed because you don't have that setting with the iPhone right now. So why do you think I'm moving to the back of the building rather than flying over the top of the building? Well, because all you guys are going to be standing out there, and I really don't want to be flying over a crowd. And also looking uh, straight up is going to be harder than if you're just out looking in the field. So we go back to the uh, safety issues here. You know, one of the things obviously the FAA is talking about is no one involved in the mission you know, should be overflown. Well, you guys would all be involved in it, but I'm still not real comfortable flying over a bunch of people with a multi-rotor aircraft. Lessons learned uh, is I was out flying this thing once. It got to the end of one row and turned, and think the Phantom came out of the sky on me, okay? I, d I wasn't doing anything at the time. At least I sure don't think I was doing anything at the time. It was the Phantom Vision, it was the version 1.0. Okay, so it wasn't the 3.0, it didn't have the better shielding, the more reliable motors. It had a decent battery in it. The thing, Pancake came down flat, um, it trashed the camera, the camera lens flew about 100, 100 feet, it scarred up the props. Amazingly, the, the airframe itself, I brought it in here, Eric looked at it, he said, Jeff, if you hadn't have told me that this thing crashed, I never would have known it. Okay. But at the same time, you know, one is none, two is one. We ended up buying another Phantom. We ended up buying a version 3.0 rather than put the money in to upgrade to the version 3 motors, put the shielding in ourselves, and, you know, put another 700 and something dollar camera on it. We just spent a little bit more and bought another frame. So our original Phantom is our beater training aircraft, doesn't have a camera on it. If I'm doing a mission, whether it's an inspection or something that I'm a little hinky about, I don't mind flying that one out there because it doesn't have a camera on it, and the Phantoms are pretty pretty tough little birds here. So you end up having kind of a staple of aircraft that you end up using for different things. Not only the way we'd have liked to have done it, but you know, if you go into this as a business, those are some of the things that you're going to end up dealing with. We have two and Inspire ones. I was out flying it a couple days after we got it. Uh, you know, I'm kind of burying my soul here, but, and, we, and uh, we were getting a little cocky, and uh, I got a little bit too close to a, uh, we were doing a windmill at the time, and the wind shift a little bit, the paddle uh, smacked up against the Inspire, it came out of the sky, we just got it back from being repaired this morning, they put all brand new arms on it with a $200 repair. All in all, we feel pretty lucky. And Marcus, Marcus is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, He likes to leave the flying to, to me most of the time, but I'm going to make him do some of it just so he can have the pucker factor that I do. <laughs> and there is some pucker factor. Okay. When we're out flying the uh, fixed wing, there's very little pucker factor. Um, if the engine fails, if the motor fails on that thing, not near as big of a deal. It actually has a program in it that it'll uh, actually circle and land. As a matter of fact, it either slows down or stops the motor every time it takes a picture. <laughs> a multi-rotor's got the flight characteristics of a fireproof safe. You know what's going to happen if something happens. If they're coming down. You know, they're generally coming down, upside down, maybe flat down. Um, I do have my hand on the S1 switch now. Would it work? I mean, if, if something happened and there was a glitch, I'd sure as hell give it a try. I keep my eye on the thing all the time. That's why today is a perfect flying day. There's not much sun out there and there's not much wind out there. And I'll have it out at the horizon. So if something does happen, at least you got a shot at recovering it. But you've got to uh, assume at any point that multi-rotor could come out of the sky. And if you don't, you're fooling yourself. It's like a hard drive. It's not, is it going to crash? But when is it going to crash? You better have a backup. 
you ought to have a plan for this as well too. Your insurance company covers that though, right? Pardon me? Your insurance company covers all that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Our <laughs> insurance company is right back here. <laughs> so uh, as a matter of fact, we are looking into the liability and insurance as well too. Speaking of that, you can get liability insurance yes. mm -hmm. and uh, on these things right now today. Yeah. Well, it depends what you're doing. What's the minimum? I have one client that uh, purchased a five million dollar liability policy. And it's costing about five thousand bucks a year. That's not bad. I picked up a million for fifteen hundred. That's part. You picked up a million for fifteen hundred. Okay. Yeah. Probably money well spent. Yes, sir. So, what exactly does vertical aspect do, anyway, as far as uh, um, guys have software? I'm uh, glad you asked, sir. We uh, we actually have a website, and I'll give you our cards. We formed the company. For one thing, we're real excited about the PIX4D uh, software, and we became a reseller for PIX4D. So uh, Mark's actually been to Switzerland, got some training over there. The software that feeds the SenseFly EB is powered by PIX4D. It's essentially the same software. That's how he is so good with this, other than being a 10-pound brain uh, as well, too. <laughs> Um, because the software is so very similar for both the fixed wing and the, the uh, PIX 4D. But, so we're a reseller for them. Uh, Mark being a surveyor, we wanted to be able to get into either we can sell someone the software and we're required to charge list price on it, but what we can give you is the hands-on training that you're not going to get if you get it online. So. Yes. You'll probably go to this later, but the difference is between the free version of Pix4D and the... No, I've got a chart that uh, shows all of that. And for those of you that have been, you know, it is a very expensive program. Uh, it does an awful lot. It is a niche program. There aren't a lot of customers out there. Like <coughs> Microsoft Word's got millions of customers that can spread their development costs over. Nowhere near as many people buy Pix4D. But it is, um, there's Agisoft and there's Pix4D out there. Agisoft is a couple Russian guys doing it. One Russian guy. One yeah. Russian guy at least. You, you say it's expensive. To yeah. us it is expensive, especially if you're just a hobbyist. What but, is it? But the, uh, if you look at Erdos, which is like, we're talking to get into it, minimum of 25 grand. Yeah, I think Pix4 if you buy the full license, I think it's like $8,000. 8700 8700 So I'll I'll talk to you a little bit about yeah. if you're interested in this, the way to do it is to actually get smart on it before you start your, your trial period. They will give you a trial of the full blown program. When I did it, I think it was seven days. I believe it's up to thirty now. You're only gonna get that once. So Download the app, learn the program, play with the free version of it, get your data sets out there, and then when you think you're fairly smart with it, then uh, go ahead and start your 30-day trial and play with the full-blown thing and see, is this something I want to do? Um, is this just making my hair hurt do this, or am I really enjoying doing this? Can I make money at it, or is this just something I want to do every once in a while? Um, you can either rent it by the month, you can uh, uh, rent it by the year, or you can do the one-time charge as well, too. So. Are you guys doing the training as well, did you say, or would you do yes. have training classes to learn how to use it? Well, we will provide, just like Mark, when uh, he sells an EB, he goes and does a training class with people. Yeah. This is something that uh, we had talked about that um, depending on what license uh, you end up buying, we could provide different levels of uh, support for that up to a full day of training if you buy the one-time license. So as you can see, I mean, you're learning some of it here, but there's an awful lot of stuff that you really need to get on the machine, hands-on, someone showing you how to do it. Pix4D's got some great tutorials out there. If you've been to their website, they've got tons of stuff out there. They're really good at the support aspect of it. Almost as good as DJI. Okay. So, but no, they are they are really excellent at the uh, support. They are over in Switzerland, so there's a little bit of a generally a seven eight you know eight hour time lag depending on what you know uh, time of the day you get them. But um, we found them to be real good in answering our questions. And Mark fires them a lot of questions and some pretty technical surveyor type questions. You know. um, yes. Are you into new dealerships? Pardon me? Are you into new dealership accounts in different areas, different cities? Uh, don't know yet. We're, yeah. we're, we're kind of feeling our way through this. Jeff's retired. I'm not. Uh, Self-employed, basically. Yeah. 
but uh, we're self unemployed. Right? Self unemployed. <laughs> 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 no, I thought I was going to retire, and after six months, I started getting really itchy. When you get to the point where you've alphabetized the tools on your tool, you <laughs> 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 to do something. And uh, you know, my my wife likes to get out of the house, but now she says, "Boy, you sure are busy with this thing." But it's really a labor of love for us. We really enjoy doing this. But in the corporate world, they've been in the military world. And as you can tell, there's some uh, passion with us for doing this. Yes. Do um, you hand fly the, the fixed wing? Or is it no. like an autopilot? No, it's got a great autopilot on it. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it goes up, it calculates the wind, it flies the pattern, it can fly a, um, a uh, crossways pattern, it comes and lands where you want it to. It, it, it talks to you as it's coming down, it gives you the altitude, you can wave off. They even put a feature in there, and wow. I realize I'm kind of talking. About but this thing looks kind of like a buzzard when it's flying, and it attracts other buzzards. It sometimes, it sometimes attracts hawks as well, too. Like, I think the folks in Australia had a problem with it that a hawk attacked it. So they got a switch in there that you can basically have it do a barrel roll if a bird's about to uh, attack it. You can have it do a real steep DE set, uh, at least give it a fighting chance. Electro-stimulus. This software in here with the ARC uh, GIS software, is it kind of well, similar? Yeah. RGIS really has no software for doing the photo rectification that I know of. Okay. Now you can read the LAS file into RGIS and build a model. Uh, it doesn't have very good tools for editing the LAS file. Uh, LP360 fits into RGIS. It's about, uh, I think, another 8,000 bucks. Of course, RGIS, the advanced version, is about 20,000 bucks. So you got to be serious about it if you're going to go that route. Yeah. Uh, they tell me the 3D analyst, you can do some stuff in RTIS with it. Are you able to manipulate files in a uh, real estate aspect? If you take a three-dimensional picture, there's a huge telephone pole, light pole in the picture, and you want to edit that out in order to print the 3D image, you're able to manipulate the file in that? Well, I, there's basically a, a misnomer right there. You're not getting a 3D image. You're getting a 3D point wow. cloud. Okay. To answer your question, yes, you can edit the pole out of the 3D point cloud. By just uh, deleting the points. Well, you reclassify them. I did a demo for the concrete. They had a conveyor coming up, so they're interested in the quantity of the pile. I reclassified the points in the conveyor, so when I did the pile, it didn't take the conveyor into account. For the the way you did the different lines on contour and typography and stuff like that, separating them out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yes. But, but without getting into editing the point cloud, the image on the right, the Phantom 57 images, it creates the ortho mosaic, and, um, and I'll show you that on the post-processing. It's about 140 megabytes in size. It's got a lot of data in there. It's not just one or two pictures. I mean, it's taken all of those cameras. So you can certainly put that into Photoshop or something else and edit it. You'd, you'd want to get it into a smaller file size before sure. you did that. But that will produce a TIFF image that you could then manipulate. Yes, sir? How much time do you have involved in that from the start of the, of the maybe even the planning process through the flight through the editing to, to the final product there, how much time is involved in that? Roughly? Okay, I did it all, so <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't process the point cloud. Jeff processed the point cloud for the building. Uh, I did the entire uh, big map, big area. Didn't do a lot of planning, uh, probably 30 minutes pre-flight okay. planning. Uh, what I did is I down in, in the software you can download the the image into your computer because most of the time in the field you're not going to have internet so you need an image or a map to show you where you are that's built into the software that comes with that plane so flew it it probably took I think 19 minutes something like that to fly it takes oh, 260 images on the machine I have now will process in about oh, an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. So then I take that. Now, I'm not talking about Steve gave me the boundary and I plotted that up and all that. 
So I fired up ArcGIS, I threw it in there, automatically get the uh, image into ArcGIS. Jeff did that one, I created another uh, window and I threw that one, they call it a data frame in ArcGIS, I threw that picture in it, typed in some stuff, I probably got maybe a total of four or five hours max. Okay, so if you're just being, at 50 bucks an hour, you're charging you know what? Well, first off, I don't work for fifty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's still, that, that's still a, a two hundred fifty, three hundred dollar charge at, at that fee. Well, yeah. fifty bucks. So if you're doing it a hundred dollars now, you're five, six hundred bucks. Well, you're kind of talking the economics. So I'll, I'll yeah. try and put it in more of a surveyor term that I, since I'm a surveyor, uh, I don't really market to the real estate people. Uh, I've got well over, I don't know how many, well over a hundred flights on the fixed one. Uh, most of them are 100 acres or bigger. So we've got some surveyors. You know, what would you charge to do a 100 acre tow roughly? Anybody speak thousands, up? Thousands. Huh? Thousands. thousands. Well, let's say 10,000 bucks, okay? Let's cut that in half to 5,000 bucks. And let's say I can only charge for 50 flights. 50 times 5,000 is 250,000 bucks. Pretty good return on your money. The well, that's not that one. I surveyed my own property, which is 10 acres. It took me the better part of a day, seven or eight hours, and I didn't really get down to the river much. I flew it in the EB in 22 minutes. Generated a conjure map. I was done in about two hours. The same thing took me seven or eight hours to do. Yeah, see, and I'm looking at it from the economic standpoint, from a business standpoint, that says, I can do this for you at X amount of dollars, where the way you're doing it now is costing you you know, 20,000, I can do it for five. Right. You know. Well, uh, also another real ad advantage, when we went to the concrete crushing place in Houston the other day, and we flew a demo out there, there were vehicles going right, left, people working, forklift, dump trucks, all that kind of crap. If you had surveyors out there with sticks, they're going to have to shut that stuff down. We flew over the top of them. They didn't even know we were there. We were parked in a corner. That's the real beauty is, is is the time and money it saves the company that they don't have to shut down operations. Yes. Yeah, I'm an inspector. So let's say I have a 14-story uh, uh, glass and concrete curtain wall. Do Is there something up there at this time to where I can do a pattern? Instead of going horizontal up and down and out, I can do my vertical. Not yet. Not yet. It's coming. Isn't that the free flight that he's maybe talking about? Or, yeah, uh, the free flight, we've right played with some of that. We've done a facade of a building, and we, we basically manually flew it left and right. And it's it's more challenging to manually fly it and, and get the correct amount of overlap, even with this app, than one might think. The problem you're really going to have, good. though, is uh, if it's a mirrored reflection, uh, all right, yeah. this is photogrammetry. So kind, kind of like an IR. Yeah, yeah you're going to have some issues there. It's not going to do well over water because it doesn't get in the deck once the water's moving. It's not going to see the water. What's your and, and really, a lot of the uh, the surveyors in the crowd, I mean, the picture in the ortho mosaic is kind of nice, but what you really want is probably the 3D model. So to them, the pictures are gravy. It's really the underlying data. What this program is really great about is feeding into other programs, and then you do further manipulation with it. And I like to tell other surveyors it's a flying data collector. Yeah. <laughs> I've got one other question. Uh, let's say you're doing a phase two environmental or phase one environmental. Um, is there something out there that's going to read the ground in one of those contours where, let's say I've got oil spill that's taking place, where it's gonna pop in my photography? I'm not quite following you. Are you saying, will you be able to see the oil spill? Yeah, well, yeah, I'll be able to see that in, in uh, the 4D uh, picture. You oh, the 3D pictures. pictures. Yes and no. It, it kind of depends. I've done some lakes. Uh -huh. It gets a little flaky looking. You really have to go in and kind of hand edit it to make it flat because we know water surfaces don't do this. So better on a continent? Or it, it has nothing to do with it. It's the reflection on the water. Okay. You, now there's a professor down at Texas A&M Corpus Christi that's been doing experimentation, putting targets under water. He's getting some fairly decent results. Why not putting a polarizer filter on the lens? Well, it's not the polarizer that's the, pro the problem. It's the problem of 
The water is constantly moving. Yeah, all this moving. You need a fixed point to make a reference off of like the corner of this laptop, you know, <laughs> but you're not going to get with water. And it's not 100% accurate, so you may have a pixel here, a pixel here, and a pixel here, so you're going to get a, an uneven surface on the water. Yeah, as, a, as a Navy helicopter pilot, one of the hardest things I did was try to hover over water. Because whereas on the ground you got a reference point, you're flying in formation, you don't have that over water. And a similar type of <laughs> okay, I think uh, unless there are any questions, we are going to be showing the post-processing uh, after we do the, the uh, flights. We are going to do a couple of short flights with both the the EV and the uh, Phantom, and uh, Mark and I'll go ahead and get set up for that. Thanks. <laughs> From behind us. Launch it that way and bring it back that way. Oh, yeah. Real light wind. Perfect flying day. We ready to go, Eric? Uh, so long as the live stream is up. Don't let me know, huh? It's up? Okay. We're good. Okay. If y'all can see this, Jeff went out in the field and plugged up the EV. It found its position. I hooked up to it with the computer. This is where it defaults. You tell it which way you want it to take off and which way you're going to land. So I'm going to change that just a little bit real quick. I'm sorry. I'm uh, setting up the takeoff and landing direction. So what happens is I'm going to tell it to come in this way. We're going to take off this way, it's going to circle, and then it's going to go fly its mission, which I'm going to allow, uh, load the uh, mission, which I pre-stored already. The reason it circles, it's, it's uh, not only climbing to altitude, but it's got a pitot-static system into it that it's calculating the winds aloft as well, too. So it can uh, adjust the flight path, it can crab into the wind as necessary to be able to produce an accurate flight path. Uh, this is the flight plan I set up recent, uh, the area I wanted to cover and now I'm just going to upload it to the airplane. Is the altitude set? The altitude is controlled, I don't, I don't know if you can see it or not. Oops, download link lost. We have to start over. See that 1.6? You control your pixel density. Go, restart it with it. Hey Eric, if I get lost, send that uh, SAR uh, burnout. <laughs> okay. Got the inspire ready for it. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, Jeff. Let me just try to connect here. <laughs> Okay, we got our mission uploaded to the EV, and I'm going to go start it. You want to give it a shot? I'll do it. All right. Launch it this way. Jeff. <coughs> He's going to shake it three times.
now you're figuring out where it's, where it's flying. This, this is the airspeed, uh, wind speed rather. It gives you the airspeed down here. We can't see it on the screen a whole hard a lot. Uh, that's how far uh, it is from our home spot. Gives you a lot of data as it's flying. Is it automatically just an RPM to to maximize its, its time? It takes care of all of them. Wow. <laughs> but what's the remote to it? It hope it goes haywire. Right now, I can disconnect. It's going to fly the mission and come home and land on its own.